I wrestled a, a lot tonight to, to determine how I was best going to present the history to you. Uh, but And my logical mind came up with a timeline. And I would like to take you now down a walk through Main Street. And uh, because that's the way Main Street was developed was block by block. So let's go block, block by block block. Speedway City is a town that was developed around the industry, the automobile industry. This was a planned residential community for an industrial complex where the working class could live com comfortably close to where they worked. In 1908, Carl Fisher was, came up with an idea to build a testing facility for automobile parts. He and his three friends, James Allison, Arthur Newby, and Frank Wheeler, contacted realtor Lem Trotter to find them suitable real estate for this purpose. Mr. Trotter found them 350 acres, five miles west of downtown Indy in two, December of 1908. By 1909, they started developing the old Presley Farm, as it was known, into a two and a half mile test track where new ideas for engines and parts could be tested and developed for the improvement of the automobile. This was the beginning. Soon after, factories and industries that built the parts started materializing on the properties across from the track. A little note here in history is in 1909, Indianapolis had 17 auto and auto part makers in town. By 1910, Indy was ranked fourth in the nation in automobile production. By 1920, the number of parts and gasoline engine related makers had grown to 40. It was indeed a, a growing industry. Well, now Carl Fisher has another idea. Let's create a residential area to house the workers that worked in these industrial plants. He was quoted in 1909 in an interview, interview saying, <clears throat> we are coming into a fast moving age and the old horse cannot go the pace. Wouldn't it be a great idea to build a horseless city just opposite the motor speedway? An industrial city devoted to motorization of all kinds of traffic. Electricity and gas would be the motive powers. Every business, house, industrial plant, and home would have the most modern equipment. The houses would be homes and not just the kind of shacks that usually infest an industrial center. Well, with that in mind, he and James Allison and Lem Trotter brought up the, most of the adjacent ground south and southwest of the track. Now, I want you to note that at this time, there were only three roads in the area. You had 10th Street coming down here. You had 16th Street coming out and the Winton went north to south, and that was the only north to south street. Around the, uh, where the Ben-Hur line crossed 16th Street, there was a smattering of homes, and there was a, a general store there that was operated by John and I, Ida Marvel. It was a uh, general store, feed store, and a stable. And next door to that was a restaurant operated by George Rosner. It also served as a barber shop. Well, Mr. Trotter, then went to work and laid out a, pl a plat from 16th Street to 10th, from Winton over to this new street he created called Main. The way that the uh, plot was laid out was that all businesses and their storefronts would face on the west side of Main, or excuse me, be on the west side of Main facing east, and the industrial area would be on the east side. All the homes would be on the north and south so that no homeowner would look at the factories that they were working in. He named the streets 16th through 10th numerically, and the rest of the streets were named after the automobiles of the time, Auburn, Cord, Winton, and Ford. And again, this is something that the town of Speedway carried on. After the war and in the 40s, there was one section of town that has old general names like Eisenhower, Patton, MacArthur. Then a newer section of town was developed. It took on the newer auto names like Cadillac, Buick, DeSoto, Lincoln, and Nash. So that's how the streets got their name here in Speedway. Now, one amusing story that Lem Trotter used to like to tell was that when he was putting in Main Street, he had his problems with the B&O Railroad, trying to extend his Main Street and sewer lines down to 10th. They were not going to let him dig up under the tracks for the sewer line. Well, the railroad officials barricaded Main Street with railroad ties. When he was refused permission, Trotter assembled his men and equipment at midnight and went to work. The sewer was put through, the railroad property was restored before morning, and he then said, now sue me. They never did. 
Well, the realty company started running ads, uh, promising all the new uh, prospective residents, they would have cement sidewalks, curbs, gravel roads, shade trees, water, gas and electric lights, telephones, lighted streets, and good inner urban service, all for $10 down and $10 a month. This is what's on this sign here. I couldn't get it to glow up any better so you could still read it, but it sat at the corner of Winton and Crawfordsville. So this is what it looked like. He had put his main street in and it had gravel road, had the sidewalks, and as you can see, there was electricity going down the road there. Well, 1912, <clears throat> the Presto Light Company, owned by Fisher and Allison at the time, moved their factory from downtown Indianapolis to a property across the street from the track. The company manufactured and distributed acetylene gas that ran the, adult, uh, the automobile headlights. Well, after the third explosion within the city limits of Indianapolis, they were politely asked to relocate. So Presto Light became the first industrial business in the area of Speedway. Not soon after, Electric Casting, Steel Castings Company followed. They were organized for the purpose of making steel castings for railroad engine freight cars, motor chassis, brake parts, and rear axles. The factory was already, it was originally one building located at 1045 Main, but in 1966, they acquired the property of the Speedway Lumber Company and expanded their operations. They maintained their operation there until 2003. Now I mentioned the Speedway Lumber Company. Frank Greenwood opened the lumber company over on, Apol on Polko Street, which was leased from Prestolite. Later, when he could purchase the property, he got a piece of uh, property from Lem Trotter at 10th and Main and moved over there in 1921, where he stayed in business for the next 40 years. Well, 1915, Mr. Allison built a factory on the west side of Main, down by 12th Street. He later moved, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it was to house the Speedway Racing Team Company. With Europe at war at this time, the European drivers were unable to race in the Ind Indianapolis race. So Allison, Fisher, Newby, and Wheeler created the Speedway Racing Team to recruit racers and fill the field. When the US entered the war, racing was shut down and this building was converted over to make the parts for the Liberty aircraft engines. It expanded over the years, but it still stands at 1200 Main. Well, the first commercial business shows up on Main Street in 1915. This was a uh, grocery store built by Joseph Rosner in the arts and craft early 20th century style. His one son, Frank, operated the grocery store on the south side, while his other son, William, operated a drugstore. Upstairs, there were a couple of offices. There was a doctor's office, a dentist office, and the freight office for the P&E Railroad. The second building materialized in 1917. This was opened as a restaurant. And then later, it, um, it had different type of uh, businesses like a furniture and appliance store, a newspaper office, legal firm, and it's now Leo's Barbershop. And that's what it looks like today. Across the street in 17, you had the Highway Tractor Company, another company formed by Fisher and Allison and some of their friends. They purchased 25 acres south of Prestolite and they built 10 ton highway tractors, but then adapted them later for military use during World War I. They operated this location from 1917 to 1923. Around this time, the Prestolite Company merged with four other companies to become Union Carbide. And that's now Prax Air. So it, it just morphed and morphed into different companies. 1918, the Eisner Building, the third store to be built at 1534 Main. It housed a department store with apartments above. Here you can see what it looked like back then. If you notice at the top, I think it must have been the style of the time. They put their names in the building. They're very proud of their buildings. Well, this is what it looks like today. It's Toland's Florist, and it, you'd still see the Eisner thing. It's still sitting on Main Street in operation. 
Around this time, though, World War I was going, and the Speedways was to hold an important place in both Indiana and U.S. history. In February of 1917, an aviation department was opened. It ran from Main Street down to Polko and from 14th Street over to Ford. The repair and re rebuilding of planes was a vital part of the war effort. Over 313 planes and 350 engines were restored here in 1918 alone. The infield of the Speedway was used as a landing and flight test field. Not only were planes repaired here, but testing of new designs and ideas were tried out and developed here. There were four squadrons with over 650 men stationed at the plant here in Indianapolis. The depot remained in operation until September of 1920. There is now a, a marker placed by the Indiana Historical Group celebrating this fact. This was put in place at, in 2018 and it sits down at 11th and Main. And you can see where it details what they did there. Well, during 1919, the Grandy Building, and I apologize for the grainy photo, but it's the best I could find. The Grandy Building became the fourth commercial building. It was opened by Herbert Grandy as a hardware store. And over the years, it went through many renovations and many other businesses went in and out, including a bank, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Well, on the East industrial side, the American Arts and Clay Company moved in in 1919 and continued to operate there until 2004 when they sold the property so that the Speedway could enlarge their parking lot. They, uh, th this company makes modeling clay and crayons and things like that. They're still in operation, but just moved further north. Well, here's a sketch of a schoolhouse. This little thing, this one room schoolhouse sat at the corner of 10th and Main. It was built in 1889 to 1999. It was used as a schoolhouse. Um, they went four blocks up the street there to 14th and Winton and, and started the Carl Fisher School. By 1930, here's what it looked like. It had grown. When they moved up here originally in 1919, it was only four rooms. So by 1930, they had, they had increased its uh, size quite a bit. Well, the fifth building on Main Street was the Schick Building. It was built by the Schick's Shoe Company, which operated in one half, and the other half was leased out to the new chain called A&P Grocery Stores. There's a picture here of Ruth and Fred Wolf, who were the managers of the store at the time. Eventually, the A&P grew and took over the whole store and then later even needed to expand more and moved further down Main Street. We'll talk about them later also. Speedway Lumber Company, as I said, they, they were located at Polko in 1914, but when he could get property, he moved over to the corner of 10th and Main in 1921. Well, John Esterline and DJ Angus relocated their business here from Lafayette, Indiana. They were moved onto the site where that highway tractor company was. The company built locomotive headlights, the six volt starting systems for automobiles and recording instruments that would be used in submarines in, in World War II. This is what it looked like in the, the 1960s. It sat at 1201 Main. We're going across the street there. Allison expanded his building and from the one story. He now went to his two story, which he built in the neoclassical revival style with the big windows. Allison thought that the workers deserved something light and clean place to work instead of the dingy and dirty factories of the time. He also had an apartment upstairs with a little quirky thing like an elevator that fit his car so he could just drive in, go upstairs and get out and he was home. Well, now, as I said, we built Main Street mostly up in the 1500 block. Well, now here is the first building that was built down in the 1300 block of Main. And this was built by a Mrs. Mrs. Mary Moltan. She was the first owner. She later sold it to Ivy Robbins and then to Sadie Fuller, who operated as a beauty store. It opened as a restaurant and had apartments above, and it was converted to a beauty shop around 1947 it became Ted's Beauty Shop, and that's what we all called it. Well, Stella Sikowski was the niece of Ivy Robbins. She was the last owner who ran the shop. She passed away in 2017 at the age of 94, and she was at the shop 
every day. In 1926, this first building to be built in the 1400 block. This was the Beeler Hodson Garage. It had indoor parking, the first indoor parking on Main. From the oral histories of the longtime residents, we learned the garage was in the back. They entered from the back alley. And then there was a center hallway that came down so that you could come out to Main Street to do your shopping. And there were a couple of offices off to the side. Today, you can find three sisters in a trunk, Lane Photography and the tax office there. Here's what it looked like. As I said, all the main commercial was up here. You see the Rosner building in the 1500. Well, here's the Beeler Hodson garage. Here's what we call Ted's. And this is the Allison building. Now this is 1926. As you look across the street, Union Carbide had grown greatly through this time. Well, 1926, that's when our town was incorporated. There was a population of 507 people, 148 heads of household. Uh, one of the interesting stories about this is that when the town incorporated, one of the first orders of business it decided was to buy the water and sewer plants from Mr. Trotter and the Speedway Realty Company. Well, Trotter, it seems, wanted $50,000 for the water plant. He wanted $150,000 for the sewer. Well, that didn't happen right away. So for the three years, they went back and forth and haggled. And finally, in 29, he sold the, the utilities to the town for the sum of $113,386.06. I'd like to hear the story of how they reached that price. Anyway, their first meetings were held like over at Prestolate on the tennis court that Carl Fisher had there. And then they eventually moved up the stairs to the Rosner in one of the offices there. Around this time, the first Christian church, who, if you remember this picture of the one room schoolhouse, that's where they were holding their congregations on Sunday. And finally they outgrew that space and they wanted to build a new one. So they went to Lem Trotter because guess what? He owned this piece of property at 15th and Winton. So they went to him and asked him if he could buy the property. And he said, no. So they turned around and were leaving. He says, wait a minute, where are you going? They said, well, you told us we couldn't buy it. And he says, that's what I said. You can't buy it, but I'll donate it. So the crew got together, the congregation got together. And on one day in September, they came to this piece of property and they put this building up in one day. Well, it served their purposes until 1948. So on this piece of property right here, they built this beautiful stone building. And it sits there today at 15th and Main. Now out on Main Street, <clears throat> the Bland Zinc building went up. Ted Bland and e Edith and Bill Zinc put in a grocery store. Again, their names are on the building and they are today too. So this is what this looked like when they built it. And here's what it is today. It's the famous soda and candy store. If you, if you go down Main Street, it, you'll see it sitting there. Well, they operated the grocery out of this building until from 1929 to 1939, when Edith decided she needed to expand her operation. So she bought the last two lots just south of Rosner's, between Rosner's and the Schick store, and she put in a new grocery store. Well, when she built this, she also got permission or however, to put the first post office in. And so she was our first postmistress of Speedway. Now I had talked about the Grandy building and a bank. Well, in the one half of this building, Speedway State Bank moved in in 1929 and they operated there till 1961. That's when they moved their headquarters over to 5300 Profitsville Road, which just became our town hall this month. And they moved their data processing down the street to 1180 Main Street. So now we have the, the, the block is completed. The 1500 block, you have Rosner's, Zinc's, Schick's, the Bland Zinc building, Eister, Grandy, and there's the 1500, uh, which is now Leo's uh, barbershop. So the whole block has now been filled. So everything stays status quo for a few years. And then in 1930, between 1936 and 37, William Rosner, builds a building at the corner of 15th and Main. 
Floyd Beck operates it as Beck's Drugstore. And it has five apartments upstairs. Today, it's now Dawson's. Those five apartments are still rented out and still in use. And also at the back of this building, there was a small uh, little office built for Dr. Hannah, who was the Speedway Tracks physician and the Speedway High School uh, physician. Now in 37, he built the, uh, adjacent to this building, he built the uh, movie theater, which is what, it was built in the Art Deco style. And it was a 600 seat theater and it operated as a movie house until the 1960s. Then after that left, a, a Trend Furniture Company moved in for a while till 2005. And then along comes the Main Street Antique Mall, which is in there now. This is a wonderful little place to find all kinds of odds and ends. It's done by consignment where people have a little booth space. So that it's always changing, something new to look at all the time. Well, now <clears throat> we talked about the A&P Grocery. They had been in the Schick building, taken over the whole Schick building. Well, now they needed more space. So Mrs. Edith Hodgson, she builds a store adjacent to her husband's indoor garage parking. This is at 1330 Main Street. So this is where the A&P store moved down to. And just within the, well, I think maybe two years ago, this was torn down and to enlarge the parking lot. And across from that building, you see the wall there is 1414 Main. This opened up as Alexander's Five and Dime Store. Had apartments upstairs and, it, and over the years, it had many, many shops in it. It was a gift shop for a while, a beauty shop. And then it was a health studio where Pat Van, the starter for the 500, ran his, his little operation out of. And as you see here, there's a door that went upstairs to the apartments. Well, it's supposed to be opening as a coffee shop uh, coming up soon. And then we get to the corner. This was the last building in this block was built in 1939. And this opened up as a restaurant and it operated that way for quite a few years and then in 1945 it became the first liquor store in, in on main street right now it's currently empty uh, there was a boom rooms hair salon in there they just recently uh, moved down the street a ways down 10th street next to charlie brown's and uh, we have a coffee shop called the spark that's about to open later this month now, if you will note, there's a raised concrete pad over here. Well, this covers up the entrance to the shoe pair, uh, shoe pair, a shoe repair shop, excuse me, I'm tripping over my words, uh, that was downstairs for many, many years. So here's the 1400 block now that it's completed. You had the Beck's drugstore, the movie theater, then you had the uh, Beeler Garage and the A&P, Alexander's Five and Dime, and the restaurant on the corner. As you see across here, the industry, Union Carbide's going strong too. Well, by 1939, the fall, the war clouds had gathered over Europe once again, and Allison Engineering ramped up for wartime production of aircraft engines. They built the V-1710 engine, which would prove to be the primary one used in most fighter aircraft during World War II. At the start of the time, Allison only employed 600 people. By the end, there were over 23,000 people working in the production of the engines. The company had to construct additional plants in and around Speedway area to handle the mass production that was required. By the war's end, they had produced over 70,000 engines for both the US and Royal Air Force. So once again, state of Indiana steps up and be becomes a part of history. Well, at this, with this influx of workers, it put quite a, quite a strain on the town. They needed to seek state aid to help them with their roads, improving their roads, improving the sanitary conditions and definitely the water plant. They needed, um, <clears throat> the school enrollment had been doubled, the church attendance rose, and many, many new homes were built during this time. In two th down at the corner of 12th and Main, the, again, the Indiana Historical Group put up a marker to commemorate what the Allison Machine Shop had done during the war effort. 
But you take a look. And as you can see, it went on into the Korean War too with the transmissions that they started developing. Well, 39 to 42, the main street continued to grow and change during this time. And over the next four years, 1300 block would be completely developed. It had more stores and services that the pop increasing population needed. 1939, so the um, Wishmere cleaners go in, Wishmeyer's cleaners, excuse me. This was a family owned business that operated in this building to 2015. Here's a picture of what that 1300 block looked like. There was a marathon, marathon gas station that went in. There was a U-Haul uh, service that was in. So this is what it looked like around, uh, I think this is around 2015, 2014. Well, this is what it's going to look like next year. They're putting in, they've torn down everything in that block now, and they're gonna put in these buildings that have mixed use real, uh, mixed use uh, commercial down on the bottom and apartments and condos up top. And then we go from 13th down to 12th and that's the complete Allison building now. It's the oldest building on Main Street. As you can see, they expand it during the war. This is, remember they had, first there was this part of the building, then they put this in and then they added this during the Second World War. Well, now it took them 30 years to get from the 16th Street all the way down Main to cross over those train tracks. And in 1948, Ira Edwards constructed and operated a furniture store in this building at uh, 1038 Main Street. After he moved out, um, it was uh, leased to the Knights of Pythias. It was a lodge hall. It had various things in it. But in 1975, the Charlie Brown's Pancake and Steak uh, moved in and it's been there. And it's one of our well-known spots here in town. We'll just back up the street one block. One of the last pieces of realty that Trotter had was uh, 12th Street down to 11th. And he sold this off to the Stop and Shop grocery store, which put in supposedly the latest and greatest in shopping in 1953. Today, uh, that's where, this is the building that we talked about the State Bank when they changed their name to First Bank and Trust. They moved down here with their uh, data processing center and they also put a branch in. Well, this is what it looks like to, today. A.J. Foyt came along and purchased the property and he, in, he has the wine vault, Foyt's wine vault. And the reason it's called that because the vault that the bank put in when they moved in is still there and being used. And the other half of the building is his, his racing shop. Well, when, before he bought it, there was a zip bicycle company and they built the premier racing bicycles in the, I think they say the world. Anyhow, they, they were here for a few years until they outgrew the space and had to move out and get a bigger factory. Well, now we get down to the 10, the thousand block from 11th down to 10th. <clears throat> there wasn't uh, many pictures of what was there. I couldn't find any. But there were different businesses in that, in that area. There was a family restaurant, UAW office, uh, car wash, and the last building to be built on Main Street was Dottie's back in that era. And today, this Dottie's Grill, this is where Dottie's Grill sat. This is the front door of Big Woods. Well, we had talked about, this is a trip down 16th Street, it's 16th Street to 10th on the east side of Main. But I wanna jump over and start talking about the architecture of Speedway City. It's known for its bungalows and many, many styles of cottages and things like that. So let's take a look at some of them. Here's the example of a front dormer that was built in 1918. This is where Edith Zink, our first postmistress lived. Oh, and I wanna add something. It seems if you remember, Mrs. Z uh, Zink built this uh, grocery store and Edith Hodgson built a building and women played a great part in the development of Speedway City. They were very, very strong, astute businesswomen. So anyway, this is where Edith lived. Here's an example of a Western style bungalow on 15th Street. 
This one was built in the 1930s. Now across the street, we have an American, what they call an American four square with Italian Renaissance. It has all limestone and sandstone corners, which makes it very unique looking. The next house is an example of a front dormer bungalow. This was built in 1920. Her, Henry and Mimi Nofke lived there. They're the people that operated the restaurant that where Leo's Barbershop is today. This house has a lot of significance. It was built in 1912. It's a gate, an example of a gable front cottage. This is a home where Len Trotter lived for a while after he got married. This is an example of an American four square. The racing history to this one is, this is where Bill Vukovic, two-time winner of the Indy 500, he and his family stayed here when he was in town for the summer. As you can see, it was built in 1916. It's had some work done to it. So I'm gonna show you a picture here of an original American four square built in the twenties. Little dormers up here on all four sides. Very interesting, very pretty. Now this we call the neighborhood, the castle. This was an example of a Normandy cottage built in the French eclectic style. It was built in 1930 for Dr. Hannah. Remember he was our, the track physician and the Speedway High School physician. Then we look at a simple little one and a half bungalow built in 1920. Has the side gable and the extended overhang. And then we have the other one, the Spanish one. This is very unique. This is up around the corner of 15th and uh, Winton. Notice the, the different styling around the uh, windows. It's all stucco, very interesting. So now we jump over to 14th Street and there's an example of an English cottage and a Greek revival. Both of these very unique styles. And then we have a Dutch colonial two-story and a mission revival. Now, uh, this home we had, like I said, the, 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 I'm trying to think, oh, John, John Natalie. He was a sales manager at Presto Light in the 30s. He lived there. And then the VP of electric steel casting lived here. It tended to, the management lived up on 15th and 14th Street and the workers lived 13th, 12th, 11th, and 10th. Uh, one of the things that Trotter did say in later years was he was a little sorry that he laid the streets out the way he did with the width because the like 15th and 14th are twice as wide as the ones when you get down to 11th and 12th. That was one of his regrets. Well, now we have one of the landmarks of Speedway. This is the supposedly, I think one of the older homes, I think is what I found out. This was built in the 1800s by James Johnson. It originally sat at 16th and Winton, or yes, yeah, 16th and Winton. It has, and it faced 16th Street. Well, they moved it up the street one block and turned it around. So now this is facing 16th Street. And for what reason, probably just to fit the property lot, but it was a, it was one of the places that was known as the chicken dinner restaurant back in the day. So that's a, a look at some of the homes in Speedway. Now I want to take you back out to Main Street and that bring you back up. This is uh, from 10th Street. We'll go back up to 16th with all the new properties that have come along. This is the community health plaza, uh, pavilion that sits at the site of the Speedway lumber, where lumber company used to sit at 10th, 10th and Main on the east side. And right across the street coming up is the indoor carding center. Sarah Fisher and her husband built this building. It also had a restaurant in it, but during the pandemic, the restaurant shut down and we'll be opening back up, I believe in two weeks or a week from now as Brasario's Pizza. And then next to them, you will find Daredevil Brewing Company it has a big brewing, uh, it's just the beer place and it has a nice big beer garden. They have a lot of special events there. And across the street from them at 1201 May, you find the Delora factory. This is where the current day chassis for the Indy cars are brought into the country and readied for shipment to the teams. This big glass space is a showroom that is for rent, for a party space, 
you can rent the space, uh, have an event there. It's a really nice atmosphere. And next to them, this originally was built by Sarah Fisher and Wink Hartman as when she was racing as her race headquarters. But is now today, it is it was Ed Carpenter's also. And then now today though, it is Andretti Harding Steinbrenner uh, racing. So the 13 to 1400 block is taking up with the Praxair building facing Main Street. Notice we have our little photo op with the uh, board winner trophy out there. <laughs> And then in the 1500 block, we have a new uh, building called the Wilshaw Apartments and Hotel. The hotel part's not done yet, but the apartments, there's actually two buildings and it's commercial on the bottom and apartments upstairs. And swing across the street and there's the Rosner building and what it looks today. The uh, Wilcox Environmental and Engineering Company came in and took over this whole space, put their headquarters in here there where Edith Zinc Grocery used to be and the Schick Company used to be. And as you see up here, I couldn't bring it up, but the Rosner plaque is still in the building. So here's what we started with. Main Street, gravel, sidewalks. This is what it looked like in the 30s. There's the zinc thing. <clears throat> and here's what it looked like in the 90s. At this point in time, they'd already combined those stories of zinc and schick and put them together. It was an aquarium shop at the time. And here's what it looks like today. And I think we'll end it at this end of Main Street where we started. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barb. I, I do think we have a few questions here. <laughs> um, this is a, a really, a, Peg wanted to know, um, she said, I think the Weir Cook's home was recently sold. I know it isn't in Speedway, but it's on the west side. Do you know where that's at? No, I do not. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about you and what all you're involved with, um, with the with, uh, Indiana Landmarks, with the Speedway, with the Automotive Association, <laughs> or, or what maybe, maybe it's easier to say what you're not involved with. Maybe that's, maybe that's a shorter list. Uh, yeah, it would be. <laughs> no, actually, I've been in racing all my life. Mm -hmm. And that is why I moved to racing uh, to Speedway is because I worked for the United States Auto Club as a oh, yeah. on track official. Mm -hmm. I did the timing and scoring for all their midget sprints, dirt car. And I also used to do the timing and scoring for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I was the assistant director of timing and scoring there for a few years. So that's why I moved. Is that's what brought me to Speedway back in the seventies was the racing. Mm -hmm. So, where did uh, you come from? The Philadelphia area. Oh, I could tell you had an accent. <laughs> <laughs> but through that, I've just gotten involved in a lot of things, like the uh, being an old timer. I've been at the Speedway for forty years. So mm -hmm. I mean, I've been a member of the old timers group, and now I'm the executive secretary for them. Um, mm -hmm which is quite a joy because it keeps, you know, people that you grew up around and worked with for years and years, keeps us all together. Uh, I also uh, am involved with the National Midget Auto Racing Hall of Fame, uh, which is, it's housed in, uh, up in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin right now, but we would love to find space down here in Speedway to bring our museum down here. But so far, no luck. So, and yeah. I, like you say, I work with uh, Indiana Automotive on their board, uh, which is an affinity group of landmarks, which is very interesting, to, uh, trying to keep in, you know, the automotive history alive here. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, we changed from USAC, you said you worked for USAC, so we changed from USAC to IndyCar. Uh, what do you miss and what do you like now? I, I'm not sure I miss anything because <laughs> <laughs> I mean basically I still do <clears throat> up until two years ago when I retired from I was a traveling official I went from one end of this country back and forth many many times a year on the road with the midget and sprints and I just got off the road two years ago so wow. uh, <laughs> I've been pretty active with it okay okay I, I do I do miss the travel I do miss the travel yeah um, so uh, we had a question here. It looks like 
I, I can, I'm not sure who, who, who asked this one. Can you talk about the schools in Speedway uh, and how they're within walking distance for so many kids? Uh, yeah, I actually have a little, if I go back to my presentation, I have a little fun fact on that. The school mm -hmm. system started, <clears throat> they started their own in 1928. And there's four elementaries that were built over during the 50s and 60s. And they were named after Allison, Fisher, Newby, and Wheeler. One of the unique systems in the Speedway School District is that there is no bus system. Everything's within walking distance. The junior high sits over here at 14th and Winton, <clears throat> right where that building I showed you was. That is now uh, a junior, uh, junior high and an elementary together. And the senior high sits up on 25th and Lyndhurst. Now, one of the things that's great about the Speedway School System is the small classroom sizes, I'm told. I mean, they have like 20 students, 23 students, constantly rated in the Nietzsche system as an A or A+. Plus. So because of the good school system and the curriculum where they teach, uh, basically, they're still reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, we'll always have a young population here in Speedway. Speedway is a good place for people to get a starter home, you know, in their first day, first uh, starting out life and uh looking for something to get their feet wet with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, is there anything else about the school? Oh yeah, I, uh, not about the schools, but I have a couple more questions here for you. Um, oops, I just lost it, hang on. Um, this one is from uh, Lori Long and she wanted to know, when did the founding fathers of the Speedway, when did they uh, move away from town and where did they go? Well, Allison died in 1928. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of them passed away. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, up on the grounds of Marion University on Cold Springs Road, mm -hmm. they all built their mansions up there. It's called Founders Row. All of them had big, big mansions up there, and they're all part of the uh, university grounds now. And as far as Wheeler died, uh, it was self-inflicted, I believe. And uh, I'm not sure about Newby. Uh, but of course, you know that Fisher, Fisher went on to create Miami Beach. I don't know about you, but in Speedway, before any of the homes moved in, Trotter planned this thing out so well, he had tree-lined streets even before the homes went in. And I cringe now every time I see a tree coming down over here on 15th or 14th Street. The people are moving in and cutting trees down. It's just like, do you know they were planted back in the 20s? Do you know what you're doing? <laughs> You know, I just, I hate it. I hate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question about the, uh, the different styles of home, of the, the different styles of home. So you went through all of those and a lot of those were sort of had an international flair to them. Was that because of the international nature of the, um, of the, I guess the drivers and the team? Well, th that never has made, been made clear as to why, but it was like at the period that those homes were being built in the, 19 say 15 to 1920s um if i remember correctly the whole thing was uh the era i mean everybody was taken by europe i mean mm -hmm. the, the right. styles and the the dress and stuff like that and everybody was very influenced by what went over on over there but i cannot address why we had like I said, why do we have a Normandy cottage? <laughs> why do we have a Spanish stucco architecture? You know, just the whim of the people. <laughs> when did um, when did international teams start racing, or was that from the very beginning? Oh, international teams. That they were right from the start, from 1909. Uh, okay. There was uh, factory teams from Peugeot, uh, uh, France, Germany. Uh, it was a big European because this type of racing was already going strong over there and we were just starting it here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what is this? Gu, Francis Gu, I think it was. You know, when he won, the story goes, when he won the race, the Frenchman, he drank champagne. <laughs> While he drove, he had, they had champagne in the pits for him that he would drink instead of water. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's always had an international flair. <laughs> That's originally, if you look at programs, it was called the International, uh, it had a big long name, but International was the front end of this race title. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a question here. What happened to the plaque that was in front of the USAC headquarters 
um, commemorating those lost in the plane crash? Do you know? Well, yeah, that's, uh, it's in storage. It's in storage uh, and it will, it'll come back out again. Uh, but right now it just got put away. Okay. That, that was a sad time. <laughs> where do you have so many photographs? Where do you get your photos? Well, for this project, I, w uh, I mean, there was a book put out in, on Speedway with their 50th anniversary. And I went to the Indiana Historical. They have a lot of pictures, but a lot of stuff I researched through, I use newspapers.com. It's a great service to, uh, that you can subscribe to. All this stuff is there to be had. If you want to search and take the time, I felt I kept feeling like I was a rabbit going down the rabbit hole. I would get looking for something and something else would shoot, catch my attention and I dart down that way for a while. But you can find these pictures that are up there in the newspapers. And I mean, that's those things were printed the day it happened or the day after. So you can pretty well rely on the facts you find there, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's what I'm trusting. Uh, but that's where I find a lot of them. But Okay, do you have a favorite building in Speedway? Do I have a favorite building? Whether it's a home or a business building, I guess. Uh, I like Dawson's. I like that building. Because I, like I said, when I was here in the 70s, that was a restaurant that was a, like a, a restaurant that's, <laughs> this is my clubbing days, I guess. But it was a restaurant that opened up and it was open all night long. It, it's she sort of opened it around I don't know if anybody on here remembers it she opened it like at seven or eight at night and it went all night long and then she was closed during the day I used to go there a lot after uh, having a few toddies somewhere in town <laughs> have breakfast at two or three in the morning <laughs> that's my favorite and now it's my favorite place to eat I love Dawson's mm -hmm. I go there all the time okay um, where can where can people find more information if they're interested in the history of uh, Speedway. Hooney has a site where the, it's a pocket site where they have some of the pictures I've been showing you. Um, oh, and out of the houses, I just walked around and took pictures basically for the houses. Yeah. Uh, like the Praxair one I just took yesterday morning. But uh, <laughs> uh, okay, okay the can, rabbit, down the rabbit hole, where was I going? <laughs> yeah, we can put those, we can send those links out if you if you want to share them with Lorianne. We'll make sure that we send those links out for everybody if they if they want more information yeah but who, like i that. said Hooney has one there's pocket sites uh there's a there's two or three yeah okay and finally how did you you came from philadelphia you say how did you get interested in auto racing i was born <laughs> my family was in it <laughs> my my father was was uh was a uh, had a car and ah. my father's sister and her husband had a midget and my father's uncle, he had a midget. And honestly, I thought that all children, because back in the days, we ran seven nights a week, all the way from Maine down to Richmond, Virginia. And I just thought that every kid did this for the first six years, of, you know, first six years of my life. And then they put me in this room with these little children that had never been paid off their streets. And I was like, I mean, you know what, you, you know, it's like a baby, you learn what you see and what you know. And I just thought everybody, you know, ran up and down the road all the mm -hmm. time. So that's, that's how. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this for us. We really appreciate it, uh, Barb. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>